This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Now we're going to look at rollover relief with a caveat attached to it. It's rollover relief but. Rollover relief but. Same process. We are reinvesting, um, but this time into a depreciating asset which is defined as an asset with an expected life of a maximum of 60 years, or it could be plant and machinery. Now, it says here, you will only be examined on fixed plant and machinery and leasehold property with a life of 60 years, nothing else. You'll be able to recognize it. Now, with the effect of this, the gain is deferred but not deducted from the cost of the new asset. Instead, it's postponed. Slightly different process, but the, the idea is the same. Until the earliest of these three things. So this is the rule. Either it's disposed of, or the new asset ceases to be used in the trade, or 10 years, whichever is the, um, uh, the earliest. Okay. So example number seven. Charles purchased a freehold factory in 2010 for 300,000. So that's our cost. And he used it in his trade. Tick. In June 22, he sold it for 500,000 proceeds. Proceeds less cost equals gain of 200,000. And in May 2022, he bought a 55 year leasehold factory so it falls within the conditions for 600,000 and then he sold that factory in February 2024 for 640,000 when he moved into rented premises calculate the gains arising on the disposal of the freehold factory in June and the leasehold factory in 2024 Okay, let's have a look at how that looks in the answer. So, as Charles reinvested all the proceeds from the sale of the factory into a leasehold property, and it is a depreciating asset, the entire gain can be held over, not rolled. Have you notice the difference? It's not rolled and therefore deducted as the other ones. It's just held. Okay. Now, the held over gain on the factory becomes chargeable in 2023-4 when it was sold. Proceeds less cost equals gain. That's when it's, so it's held until, you don't pay tax on it, so it's deferred, but you only hold it until the earliest of those three things. It's disposed of, it's no longer used, or 10 years. So, you hold it, you don't deduct it, you hold it until such times as one of those three things happens. And in this case, they sold it. That's when you pay the tax. So you don't actually have to pay it until later. Then there's the further gain. Proceeds less cost equals gain. When the leasehold factory is sold. Okay. You can't have bad relief. Or you can have several reliefs at the same time. Always make sure that you're aware of those different ones and how they work together and interact. Always think of the various different ones. Now, this one is unlikely. This here is unlikely at TX, in my opinion. It's, it's very complicated. It's more likely to be an advanced tax answer. Um, so just read through that. There, there isn't anything really to be to be gained from that. There's no examples because there's no questions because I don't think they've ever asked a question on that one. Now, this is a gift holdover relief. So a gift is a chargeable disposal. Two chapters ago, that's kind of what we looked at. Now, if it is a chargeable asset, then it will be subject to uh, capital gains tax. Now, the donor, the person making the gift, is treated as making a disposal at market value. Not at arm's length transactions. We discussed that in uh, the previous chapters. 
the donee is the person, so that's the donor. The donee is treated as though they acquired the asset at market value. When the holdover relief is claimed, the donor's gain is deferred and the gain is deducted from the market price. Now, very, very similar to rollover relief. So, for example, if we got an asset that's worth 100,000, maybe cost of 60. So if we sold it, we gifted it, the gain would be 40. So it's a gift of an asset. Okay. Now, it's not about reinvesting. So this is one individual. This is somebody not at arm's length. For example, father, daughter. She is deemed to, this is the market value. She is deemed to have acquired it at the same time. But if he'd sold that to an outsider, third party outsider, he would have had a gain of 40,000. Obviously, you then applied rules for what kind of reliefs he's available, what kind of taxes got, has he got losses, all of those. But the basic concept is, if he sold it for a hundred thousand, he would make it a gain of forty, and then you would have applied all the other rules afterwards. So, having gifted it across to his daughter at that price, she acquires it at that price, but it's got a gain in it. Okay, and that gain, somebody's got to pay it at some point. So, her base cost when she eventually sells it will be sixty because that's been held over under gift relief. Here we've got that example. David bought an asset for 60,000 in June 18, in September 2020, gifted it to Tommy when it was valued at 100,000. Assume they make a claim for a, a gift, holdover relief, work out the base cost. I've shown you how the process works. So for David, he made a disposal. Okay, he made a disposal. Market value, because it's a connected person's. It's a connected person's transaction means we've got a gain top down bottom up this is there is no cash no cash no tax and the whole thing is relieved using gift relief which is then removed from the market value on acquisition giving a base cost of sixty thousand pounds now Interaction. I've talked to uh, briefly about the fact that some of these um, reliefs interact with each other. So we have here, when a claim for gift holdover relief is made, the donor may lose their entitlement to the business asset disposal relief. If the asset qualifies, then gift holdover relief is claimed. Um, it can be applied before business asset relief. There's all sorts of I would think in your exam, you're only likely to get one at a time. Advanced tax is where you're going to get um, interaction with these. Now, this relief is only available to individuals and must be claimed. Okay, I'll tell you why it's got to be claimed. Because the father actually made the gain, but the daughter will pay the tax. So they have to claim because the daughter has to agree in writing to pay that tax on her father's gain. And that's why there's a joint election. We don't need one for rollover because in both situations, um, the, the individual owned both buildings. Now, there are some qualifying assets. You can claim gift relief on the following assets. Assets used in the trade of the donor, if he's a sole trader, or their personal company. Okay. 
So this extends the relief to assets owned by the individual but not used by him directly. So shares, they must be not quoted. Okay. And it must be their personal company if it's the shares. Now a company qualifies if they own 5% of the voting rights. So capital gains can arise if you sell something whole, sell something part, gift something completely like we did with this one where the daughter paid nothing but agrees to pay the tax. That's a full gift. Sometimes there's a gift at undervalue. Let me give you an idea. Um, say, for example, I, I was running a business and it was worth a, a million pounds and I was going to gift it to my son. Um, but in order to be able to enjoy my retirement, I want to go and live in the south of France. I need £300,000 to buy a decent villa. So rather than charge my son a million pounds for the asset, which means he'd then be in debt in order to run the business, that probably wouldn't work. I don't want to gift it to him because I need some money for my retirement. So I gift it to him at what's known as a sale at undervalue. And the only reason my son has had it at 300,000, for example, is because he's my son. And therefore I have I have gifted it to him or sold it to him at undervalue, but I've had some cash. Okay, now remember the principle before. No cash, complete rollover, complete gift, no cash, no tax. Part cash, you will pay tax on it. Same with the rollover. If you didn't reinvest all the money and you kept the cash, you pay tax on it. Same with this. If you gift something but have a measure of cash, but not full market value, you will pay tax on it. So in order to do this, do you remember when we did rollover, it was the amount of money you kept. It's not quite the same with gift. You what, what you have to do is you have to do what actually happened, what the actual proceeds were that you got, the 300,000, less what it actually cost you. The figure that finalizes that, that, is what you would then use um, to pay to put in your tax computation. So any proceeds received in excess of the original cost are chargeable. So you have to do an actual proceeds minus cost equals gain, and that's what you pay tax on, not the proceeds that you received. Okay, so let's have a look at example number nine. Richard acquired a 25% holding in an unquoted trading company for £60,000. He was an employee of that company. And in March 23, he sold the shares to his son for £85,000 when their actual value, okay, so their actual value was £200,000. And they've claimed gift relief. What is the chargeable gain, if any, incurred by Richard? And with the base cost for Richard's son of those shares that he now has. So Richard, let's do him first. The market value of the shares, because it's a connected persons transaction, was 200,000. Lots of rules coming into play here. Connected persons always use market value. Less cost. Proceeds, less cost equals gain. Now we need to take off now the gain deferred. So we have a gain of 140,000. Now what actually happened? We had proceeds of 85 and we had a cost of 60 which leaves us with what he actually what the proceeds um the actual event and he had 25 
25,000. That was the gain here, 25,000. So that's the amount of the gain that is going to be claimed gift relief because 25,000 he needs to pay. Um, we need to put into his to his capital gains tax computation. Less annual exempt amount, 12,300. Gives us a taxable gain. of 12,700. Okay. Now the base cost for the sun. What was the market value of the shares? The market value of the shares was 200,000. This the gift relief that we've claimed that reduces that market value. So that is the base cost of those shares. Now, sometimes when we have these things, not all of the assets are used for trade purposes. We've looked at when we did rollover relief, what happens if a percentage of the building that we were rolling over had not been used for trade purposes. That's the same situation here. So there may be that I am gifting my business to my son, a million pounds. Um, within the balance sheet, I have investment properties, something along those lines. Now, they will tell you in the question, if this arises, it'll either be a figure so balance sheets worth a million pounds, a hundred thousand of it is investment property, or it will say balance sheet is worth a million pounds, 10% of which is investment properties. They will tell you, you won't have to guess. So where only part of an asset is used for trade purposes, um, the relief is restricted, obviously, because this is all about business reliefs. This is the restriction. <clears throat> chargeable assets, chargeable business assets divided by chargeable assets. So what are chargeable business assets and what are chargeable assets? So an asset cannot be a chargeable asset where any profit might arise on the disposal which wouldn't be chargeable to chargeable gain tax. So on a balance sheet, You might have land and buildings chargeable, uh, fixtures and fittings, that's capital allowances. You may have cars, that's exempt. Um, debtors, bank, cash, none of those are chargeable to capital gains tax. So it rules out current assets such as stock, debtors, receivables, exempt assets such as cash, cars and chattels. Um, so chargeable assets, you've got to remember what is chargeable and what isn't. Okay. Then you've got chargeable business assets normally uh, that are used just for the business trade. So let's have a look at example uh, number 10. Now remember, you're looking for proceeds less cost equals gain. Then you check out the reliefs afterwards. That's kind of how it works. So John owns 100% of the shares in John Limited, in which he is the managing director. On the 1st of December 2022, he made a gift of the shares to his son, when the market value of the shares was £800,000. The shares had cost him 200000 in February 2002. Now, these are the assets. We've got land and buildings, 
Okay, we've got goodwill, we've got investments. We've got stock, work in progress, debtors, bank, cash. None of these bottom ones are chargeable. None of those are chargeable assets. Don't take part in these. Okay, so this is £800,000. Now, what we need to do now is to work out his chargeable gains on those shares and the base cost of those shares for his son, John. find the example there we go so John's proceeds from the question that comes from the question 800,000 question also gave us the cost every time proceeds minus cost equals gain every single time all right now we have to think about whether or not we can get any reliefs gift relief we had a gain of 600,000 and then over here we have chargeable business assets over chargeable assets. The way to remember it, it's always the big number on the bottom. Okay. So the gain times the chargeable business assets. Now what have we left out of there? Okay. We've left out the investments they are chargeable yes that's why we left them in the top half of the question but they are not business assets so they're included in the 800,000 but not in the 700,000 so the gift relief, this is what we can claim. This is the claim. The maximum we can claim is 525, leaving us with a gain, a gain of 75. Now, because this is a business that is being sold in its entirety, they can claim bad relief and only pay tax at 10%. Take off the AEA. Also, if you've got any allowance uh, uh, losses brought forward, then you could take those off next. And John's base cost is the market value of the shares less what's been deferred in. So that's his base cost for future sales.